Yeah, thanks everybody for, um, for coming out. So uh, I think for this audience, I'll just dispense with the introduction to Fractional Quantum Hall, which I think we've already heard three, four, five times today, and uh, just try to bring you through a whirlwind tour of more experiments than I should probably describe in a talk of this length. Um, before I start, though, let me acknowledge, so I'm going to tell you about two sets of experiments. One uh, deals with, quote unquote, conventional fractional quantum Hall systems, but realized in graphene header structures. And the last uh, concerns um, imaging studies of uh, fractional churn insulators and twisted molly telluride, to which you've already been introduced today. Um, the first two are, are led by uh, Noah Samuelson and Liam Cohen, both PhD students in my group, actually Liam now postdoc, and Evgeny uh, Redikoff uh, led the, um, the second part. Okay, so um, my one obligatory slide on fractional quantum hall, I just want to point out, uh, you know, we, we all know this history and um, we know the theoretical developments, I think, that uh, led to a pretty uh, comprehensive understanding of the basic features. Um, there are a number of uh, basic predictions about fractional quantum Hall states, fractional charge, the nature of the edge states, the nature of the exchange statistics in the bulk. And these have all been observed or not observed to various degrees of precision and, you know, believability, let's say. Okay? Part of the nature of this, of the first part of this talk is to just tell you about where we have come in Van der Waals heterostructures in terms of being able to either uh, do some measurements for the first time, like the experiments on the chiral Lundra liquid that I'll tell you about, and other experiments perhaps in a slightly different or better way than what could be accomplished in, uh, in gallium arsenide header structures, for example, which were sort of the, the state of the art uh, until very recently. So um, all of the experiments I'll tell you about today really are the result of 15 years of concerted work to improve the quality and control we have experimentally in Van der Waals header structures, starting from the discovery of graphene, which I didn't even list here, but then figuring out how to get rid of different sources of disorder, how to introduce new control knobs uh, without int introducing additional disorder, and make, uh, uh, make Van der Waals header structures as we do today, which consist mostly of graphite, hexagonal boron nitride, and, and the occasional transition metal chalcogenide, um, but of essentially arbitrary complexity and with the quality uh, in terms of bulk disorder, at least for graphite-based uh, materials, that is, you know, rivals that of, you know, things that you would grow in a 3.5 uh, MBE machine. Um, but, of course, as I think everybody knows, this is all assembled more or less in air and just relies on some miracles of uh, material science and chemistry that uh, most physicists working in this field, myself included, don't even pretend to, to understand. Um, what matters for us, though, is sort of where we have gotten, right? So. This is a trace of the chemical potential of Bernal bilayer graphene at 13 tesla and 13 millikelvin. And what you're looking at is a partially filled N equals zero Landau level, and each of these jumps is a fractional quantum Hall state, and you see sort of a deep series of fractional quantum Hall states. Um, the gaps in these systems, because uh, screening is relatively weak compared to semiconductors, the gaps can be relatively large. So actually, the big, I was looking through this before because this number becomes relevant at the end of the talk. The largest gap you get for a one-third state in monolayer graphene where these gaps are large is six or seven milli-electron volts is the thermodynamic gap, and the activation gap is maybe three times smaller than that. Okay, so that's sort of where we start from in, in graphene in terms of just the quality of the material. Looks very good. Um, and of course, you know, in the last part of the talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, sort of realizing similar physics of anions in different types of systems, in particular lattice systems. This started off in partially filled Hofstadter bands uh, a few years ago where you have a lattice and you go to partial filling one of these Harper Hofstadter bands and you get, again, you know, sort of like Jane's sequence of fractional quantum Hall states at partial filling of a lattice band, not of a Landau level, but then has gotten really popular since these were discovered at zero magnetic field, first uh, at UW and then at uh, MIT in, in these different materials which you've heard about uh, earlier today. So I'll try to cover sort of, you know, what the opportunities are um, in 2D materials specifically, largely from an experimental perspective um, in terms of what you can actually do. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you about is uh, the physics of chiral Luttinger liquids uh, probed in quantum point context. So um, the uh, Luttinger liquids are the interacting one-dimensional version of a Fermi liquid, but has very different properties, right? And the important one for us is this orthogonality catastrophe, which basically says that the 
ground state of a Luttinger liquid doesn't have a overlap with a single electron wave function. Um, and the experimental consequence of that is that tunneling of a whole electron into a Luttinger liquid is suppressed, and it's suppressed by some power law, okay? Um, now, in general, in 1D systems, that power law is not, uh, is not a quantized value. It's something that depends on the details of, uh, of the system. So, for example, in carbon nanotubes, it depends on the diameter, and it's sort of measured to be in some range, and that's something that's a physical property of the system, but it's something that depends on details. Okay, but uh, on a fractional quantum Hall edge, as Xiaogang taught us, you know, back when I was, you know, in elementary school, um, uh, the physics of the edge is different. Um, in particular, there's a quantization of the Luttinger parameter that uh, occurs basically because of a bulk edge correspondence that's sort of unique to fractional quantum Hall states, uh, where you expect actually this power law for tunneling, for example, a whole electron into the fractional quantum Hall edge to become quantized. So, for example, for a one-third fractional quantum Hall state here, M would be one-third, then you expect the power law for whole electron tunneling, tunneling to be two. And I think this is a, you know, this is a, a result that, you know, I think every, everybody knows, but it turns out actually wasn't, you know, in theory, but it was never really done experimentally to great satisfaction. So the main efforts uh, in the 90s in gallium arsenide were to use something called cleaved edged overgrowth um, wires, so the, or, or, or two-dimensional electron gases. So the way this works is that you have your two-dimensional electron gas seen from the side here, and the edge state runs along the boundary, but you actually cleave it inside UHV, and then you grow a tunnel barrier and then a three-dimensional electrode on the edge, and then you try to tunnel electrons from this heavily silicon-doped gallium arsenide into that edge. And they indeed observed power laws, but they didn't observe universal power laws, okay? And in, rather than seeing, you know, I think here they were supposed to, I don't remember if they were supposed to see two or three in this particular regime, but they didn't see either two or three, and they saw that it depended on magnetic field and where you were in the plateau, and it, it didn't come out to a universal number, okay? And the reason why this failed, I think, is at least clear in retrospect, which is that statements about universality tend to be statements in some very specific limit. So in particular, in the limit of low enough bias and low enough temperature, maybe you expect these power laws to be universal, but nothing says that that's the temperature or bias that you're able to apply as an experimentalist. You might just need to go to a microkelvin to see uh, to see that physics, and in particular, when you have disorder, the general uh, effect of disorder is to make that universal regime harder to reach. Okay, so this sort of was, uh, you know, was close, but uh, but no cigar. Now, the most simple way you can try to do this experiment, yeah. Correct, yeah, correct, yeah. So it was not a, it was in this range, and it was a continuous function of where you were in the plateau. Yeah, so, so it wasn't the right value, and it wasn't even the same value every time. Yeah. Okay, so the best way you could do this experiment, and the simplest place to, to try and probe this is actually in a sing, at a, tunneling at a single point. This is very nice, because there are many exact solutions that are available, because it maps to uh, essentially non-interacting one-dimensional wires that only interact at, you know, one boundary. And that's an exactly solvable problem, and in fact, exact solutions exist under a variety of, um, of, of instances. And actually, that's exactly what you would do if you could do tunneling at a single point contact. Now, in, you know, it turns out this doesn't work in gallium arsenide for the same reason that you have lots of, it's very hard to make a clean quantum point contact in general, right? It's just very susceptible even to very weak disorder. Now, in, in two-dimensional materials, it's still really hard. Okay, and, and the reason is that um, all of the things that I showed you before are sort of fab tricks. They all rely basically on using large single crystals of graphite. And now you want to cut that single crystal of graphite up, and any way that we knew how to do that, and we sort of played around with this for years, as did people in the field um, more broadly, introduce some kind of disorder right at the point contact. So one option that you have is just to use conventional lithography, but actually using metals in general is very bad for these materials, it, it, intro it introduces disorder itself because metals are not actually equipotentials, they're polycrystalline kind of mess, and at the level of potentials that you care about, this turns out to be bad. Another way to do it is to take a piece of graphite but then burn trenches in it, but it turns out you can't burn the graphite without also burning the dielectric and introducing some dangling bonds and, 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 and disorder that way. So basically until a couple, you know, a year or two ago, we didn't really know how to uh, keep the quality that we like in the bulk of our two-dimensional electron systems, but also introduce local control, okay? 
So, um, so none of these things really quite work. And if you look at quantum point contact measurements done you know, by these different groups, um, you see that as you go through a plateau transition in the point contact, there are many resonant states. That's because there are many dots that are forming there because of local disorder potentials and so on. Okay, so the trick that turns out to work to solve this is something called anodic oxidation lithography. Actually, this is a technique more or less as old as I am. It goes back to the 90s, even earlier. Uh, and it was something that back then people did when they didn't have a clean room. So if you wanted to pattern something small and you had an AFM, you could try to sort of oxidize an oxide or silicon or gallium arsenide. It's been used in every material. Um, it was shown you know, a few years ago that in graphene you could also use it, but you could cut through the graphene completely. Now that turns out to be a bad way to pattern graphene, but it's a great way to pattern uh, graphite. And the reason is the following, which is that you know, when you take your, so the way this works is that you have a conducting AFM tip in a humid environment, and if you touch the graphite and you pull the tip back, you form a little water meniscus in between the two. Now if you put a voltage to your conducting tip, this will just burn the graphite inside that little fluid cell. There's some electrochemical anodic oxidation that happens to the graphite where you just can cut right through it. So you cut an X like this, for example. Now, in principle, that should just produce carbon dioxide. In real life, it doesn't. It produces graphite oxide and amorphous carbon and all kinds of junk, which is why if you try to pattern graphene like this, it's not great, you just make ribbons the same way you usually do. But then a miracle occurs, which is that if you then take that graphite and try to pick it up and integrate it into your van der Waals header structure, so you sort of laminate it with boron nitride and then lift it off the surface, what you find is that all of the amorphous junk that you didn't want gets left behind, and you just get this perfect clean uh, cut, okay, with you know, very nearly perfect uh, edges, okay? Now, what this means is now you have a way to make pattern gates inside of your two-dimensional header structure and then control the potentials individually. So this is what we do. So this sort of first device I'll show you is you make these, this X, okay? And then, you know, through sort of standard processing, but that happens far away from the active area of the device, you uh, can connect different electrodes to this so you can control the potential on these different, uh, on these different quadrants. These are your gates and you can use that to pattern basically a saddle point potential in the graphene underneath. Okay, I'll skip sort of, you know, basic characterizations, and you can find papers on archive about this, and just show you the experiment we're interested in, which is where we use those gates to create a junction between a nu equals one edge on one side and a nu equals one third edge on the other. Yeah? I think I missed the trick. So, um, why is all the amorphous junk far away from where the AFM tip was? It's not, it's right there. But that's on graphite on silicon oxide. And then you use a boron nitride layer, and you come and you laminate it, and then you lift the graphite off. And because sometimes the Almighty is kind to us, the junk does not come with it. So you leave the junk behind, and now you've just picked up graphite. Yeah. Because it's the Almighty that's... Yeah, yeah, the Almighty is important here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was not a predictable... I mean, it's obvious in retrospect. It's harder to, you know, it's harder to pick things up than it is to not pick things up. Things that pick up are special. They need to be really flat. Amorphous carbon is not. Graphite is. So graphite laminates with boron nitrate, and that weak van der Waals force on a very flat surface builds up, and now you can pick something off of what it was sitting on. But if it's a rough surface, then you don't get much van der Waals. Van der Waals is a weak interaction. So it all makes sense, you know, hindsight 2020, right? Um, yeah. Oh, you can cut through, I don't know, five nanometers easily. Probably more, yeah. Um, we typically use something three to five nanometers uh, for the graphite. Cut a single layer, couple layers, it's all the way through. Yeah, 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 it's cut all the way through. It's definitely cut all the way through, yeah. Um, okay, so, so, uh, so what you're looking at here, okay, is now we've created the situation where we have a one-third and a one-edge, and we're applying a bias across it, so this is the voltage bias, and this is a voltage that controls the, the height of the barrier between the nu equals one and one third, okay? And at low bias, you see that you always have a, a suppression of the, conduct, of the conductance across the device which is being measured. And then at high bias, you see that you have a large conductance, and actually that conductance is saturated to a value of one half, which I'll come back to later. Now, um, at weak tunneling, right, so we're gonna first focus on the regime of sort of where it's black on this scale. Weak tunneling is where you expect the universal physics to happen. This is a stable fixed point of the RG. This is where Xiao Gang would say, you know, you should have this universal tunneling exponent for the uh, conductance. Okay, so we expect T squared and V squared conductance uh, as, uh, uh, when you're close to low conductance, when you're close to zero. And this is a boring 
it just works. Okay, so you can just measure this. You can measure v as a function of v bias, and you see that it's really a perfect uh, v squared power law. And if you do t, it's almost as good. You can see some deviations at high temperature and low temperature. We understand this reasonably well. Here it's because our thermometry is not actually perfect, and here it's because at some point, you know, you're not in the low T limit anymore, but it basically makes sense. And if you go, we've checked one other spot in the plateau, you get the same number, okay? So it just works fine, right? It turns out not to be actually the most interesting thing in this experiment. So the most interesting, okay, so then you can, you know, you, you have a lot of control, right? So you can vary the height of that tunnel barrier. And you can see that, you know, all the curves collapse onto each other in the universal regime of low conductance before they deviate, more or less as you would expect, at higher T. But the really interesting thing here is, uh, is something that's not as obvious, which is what happens when you actually just go ahead and go to either high temperature or high bias, okay? And there you see that everywhere here is yellow, and yellow corresponds to half the conductance quantum. That's not a very obvious thing because you have a nu equals a third in series with a nu equals one. For most fractional quantum Hall phases, if you did that, you'd expect the conductance to be a third, right? Instead, you get a higher conductance than that. You get a half. You get 50% bigger conductance, okay? And that's a very robust effect. It's not quite quantized. Quantized, you wouldn't use it for metrology, but it's pretty close. So it turns out that's actually something that was studied, again, you know, a long time ago and understood relatively well, and it represents basically a strong coupling fixed point of this, uh, uh, you know, of this problem of coupling these two edges at a single point, okay? Um, and uh, the idea there is that, you know, one way to think about what's happening at that fixed point is to ask, okay, what is the low energy process, the probable process that couples charge from one side to the other? You have quantized charge of E on one side, sorry, not rendering well on this projector, and quantized charge of E over three on the other side. So one way would be for, you know, to ho tunnel whole electrons, and that's what happens at the weak coupling fixed point. But at the strong coupling fixed point, the uh, theoretical picture is that you have an analog of an Andreev process. So basically, 2e over 3 comes in, an e goes across, but then you retroreflect a minus e over 3 hole on the upstream edge. Now, in contra, what you can do experimentally in a superconductor normal metal junction, here you actually have a very beautiful experiment which you can do, which is that you can make individual contact to the incoming current and to the retroreflected hole, because they're on different edge states. So if you just go ahead and apply a voltage here with your new equals one side grounded, you can measure the voltage of the retroreflected hole, and that's what's plotted here. As a ratio, you see that it just comes to minus half the voltage you put in, or very nearly, okay? So this is a bit surprising, actually. You know, in theory, I think if you'd asked, if you'd asked many theorists before this experiment whether this was possible, they would have said no, because it's not actually a stable fixed point of the RG, and so any perturbation, you know, non-linearities in the dispersions. Ah, it's never going to work in experiment. Actually, it works sort of remarkably well. Okay. Yes, Nancy Sandler had a paper. Yeah, and like, even more crazy, right, uh, Mitya Cholowski and Halperin not only had a paper, they just assumed this would work and said, you know what you can do? You can build a DC voltage step-up transformer out of this, right? And in fact, you can do that, and that's what we did. So if you wire this slightly differently, right, you can use the fact that this process, this Andreev process, is happening essentially 100% of the time to convert, you know, a low voltage on your input into a larger voltage on your output, because this functions essentially as a perfect current mirror, okay? Every current, you know, every 2e over 3 that comes in, a minus e over 3 is mirrored out, and an e is mirrored the other way. If you have a current mirror, you know, you can look in an electrical engineering textbook, you can use that to make a voltage transformer. Usually, you take the transistor, and it doesn't have very good efficiency because you're burning a lot of power in the transistor. Actually here, because there's no fluctuations, if you're really at that strong coupling fixed point, there's no fluctuations in the current. Every e, 2e over 3 comes in, minus e over 3 goes out, e comes out, there's no dissipation. And so if you actually just experimentally measure the, basically the efficiency of this transformer as realized in our experiment, it's like 97%. And the, um, the gain, which, okay, in, in the theoretical model should be one and a half exactly, is 1.47. So it's very close to kind of this ideal model. It's actually not at all clear why in the experiment the other irrelevant operators don't bother us. But, okay, that's really not our problem. <laughs> it just worked pretty well. Okay, so that's sort of topic one. So then, um, once, you know, okay, <laughs> easy for a PI in a talk who's not actually doing the work to say, well, once you've made one quantum point contact, just put two of them. Uh, but, okay, it turns out that, that you can, right? So this is a picture 
of a more complicated type of device, right, where for various technical reasons I won't get into, we chose to make these point contacts a slightly different way, but this is now, you have two point contacts that are realized by, you know, each of these is a piece of graphite that can be tuned, whose potential can be tuned differently, okay? So now you have sort of five different control voltages, some of which control your point contacts, some of which control the doping of your whole interferometer, and then one of which is just controlling the area far from the point contact. So this is a standard Fabry-Perot interferometer where we're gonna snake an edge state in uh, here and have it weakly backscattered or strongly backscattered um, at these point contacts and then look for interference corrections to the cross device conductivity. Now, you know, the history of this problem, I think everybody's super well aware of, right? This was something that people tried for a really long time, but eventually Mike Manfra, I think to everybody's satisfaction, succeeded in showing that he had an interferometer where he understood all of the complicated Coulomb effects that happen and Indeed, what Manfra and Nakamura observed is that as a function, you know, if you, if you put all of your uh, quantum Hall system in the nu equals one-third state, then you see that uh, you can be in this Fabry-Perot, in this aronoff bohm dominated regime, so the phase slopes downwards, that's good, but then there are phase slips. And the picture for this is that these phase slips occur when an enion, one of the localized E over three quasi-particles, tunnels from outside the interferometer into the bulk of the interferometer. And that's, and it's the enion phase that's contributing these, uh, these phase slips that, uh, that you see. And if you look at their value, they're pretty close to 0.33. You don't expect them to be exactly 0.33 because there's something called bulk edge coupling, which is that when you introduce charge to the middle of the interferometer, its size can change. And so you'll get a change in the aronoff bone phase because of that bulk edge coupling. And the key thing that enabled this experiment to work was the fact that these heterostructures are designed with screening layers, so layers of two-dimensional electron gas that are quite close to the main one, and they basically screen the Coulomb interactions between bulk and edge, okay? Um, it turns out that in our electrostatic geometry, it's almost identical, because our graphite gates are just about the same distance from the two-dimensional electron gas, and so our bulk edge coupling, you sort of expect to be very much in the same, in the same regime. Okay, so we can do this, we make our device, we go ahead and look at, uh, you know, we, we go to nu, nu equals a third, we pinch off the QPCs, we can see the sort of suppression from Luttinger tunneling at each one, and you see nicely developed quantum interference as a function here of the plunger gate, but basically as a function of anything that you tune, you'll see uh, uh, interference. So what does it look like if we try to do the Manfra experiment? Okay, so we're doing the same thing, we're sweeping magnetic field on the x-axis, that's up here, and uh, this plunger gate voltage on the y-axis. And what you see is downward sloping lines where the phase is more or less continuous. That makes sense for aronoff bohm dominated interference, so this is not, you know, so-called Coulomb-dominated. But then you see phase slips, okay? So you see that here the phase jumps, and here the phase jumps, and here you see a whole series of phase slips sort of resets. <coughs> and you can try to measure that phase by just trying to subtract out the aronoff bohm part, and you can see that the size of these phase, phase slips is pretty clustered around 2 pi over 3, so what you would expect for this enion phase. Actually, you can do a control experiment in the integer quantum Hall case where the charge is actually bigger, and you expect Coulomb effects to be larger, and you find that the phase, you do see some phase slips there, but they're much smaller. They're generally less than point, you know, around 0.05 or something like that, okay? But there's actually a novelty here which is quite different from the, the Manfra experiment. So if you go back to the Manfra experiment, what you see is that these phase slips follow a line that has a, a finite slope. That makes sense if you're in equilibrium because the effect of the magnetic field and the effect of the gate actually are kind of similar, right? In a Landau level, both of them would change the equilibrium number of quasi-particles. That's not what we see in our device. What we see in our device is that as a function of magnetic field, these phase slips happen absolutely suddenly. They happen from one line trace to the next, sometimes right in the middle of a line, okay? That's pretty different, okay? That does not make sense with equilibrium, with an equilibrium picture where basically gates and magnetic fields should do the same thing. And it turns out that's because it's not an equilibrium, okay? Basically the quasi-particles are just very far from equilibrium. So, um, so what I'm showing here is a sweep of the same type of data, but now we're gonna ramp the magnetic field pretty fast, like over half an hour, okay? And over half an hour you see that for the first 20 minutes or so, you can change the flux and no new charge comes in, there are no phase slips. Okay? And, but then if you stop and you ramp it back the other way, you see that, okay, for the first 10 minutes or so, there's no phase slips, and then suddenly a bunch of phase slips. Okay? And they're all around uh, 2 pi over 3. 
Okay? And so this basically makes sense. We actually know from other experiments that at high enough fields and low enough temperatures, just the RC time of these devices is really long. The gaps are big enough. The nature of disorder is such that the hopping of charges can easily take longer than you have the patience to wait for. Okay? And, and that's the case here, right? So now, this turns out to give us a really great opportunity because it turns out that actually changing the magnetic field and changing the, really the thing that matters here is not that the magnetic field is changing, it's that we're waiting. It's just time is the thing that matters. We just can wait for the quasi-particles to come in one at a time. Yeah? So, do these long time scales exist only in graphene and not in gallium oxalide? I believe that they, I mean, they exist in all of these semiconductor systems. We've noticed them in graphene for some time. I think it probably has to do with the, uh, different nature of disorder in graphene versus gallium arsenide. It's not something I have a super coherent picture for, but I think in graphene, you probably have very rare and deep potential wells, like adsorbates or something like that, whereas in gallium arsenide, it's modulation doping and really long wavelength disorder potential. So I have a feeling that in gallium arsenide, it's just the barriers are lower, and here, the barriers are really high between well-separated defect sites. But that's, that's a guess. So, yeah, I mean, certainly in a dirty semiconductor, you know, you can make RC pens as long as you want if you go cold enough. But, uh, um, uh, but in, in Manfred's experiment, at least, which was under quite similar conditions, this is not observed. Yeah, and I asked them, it's not something that they see as far as, as, far as they know. Okay, so let me just show you sort of the time domain equivalent of this then. So now what we're going to do is just we're going to use the fact that charge jumps in on like 10 minute time scales, but we can sweep the gates as fast as we want. Okay, so what I'm showing you now is just one parameter sweep. We're going to just sweep back and forth. This is VC, that's the voltage on the center gate. That has the effect, if you sweep it in a really narrow range, just a couple of millivolts, of just changing the area of the interferometer, but we're at fixed field, okay? So we sweep that back and forth. You can see there's a few curves there, and you just sweep out the same curve. The reason why it's not like a beautiful sinusoid is actually you change a little bit the transmission of the point contacts while you do that. So there's sort of some extra wiggles on top, but you basically see it's the same curve. Now what we can do is over the course of, you know, an hour or two, we can slowly increment the chain, you know, the range over which we're sweeping this, okay? And you can see that it just keeps tracing out the exact same curve. All we're doing is just making the area breathe a little bit, changes the flux, you know, by whatever, 10 flux quanta in and out, right? In equilibrium, this would correspond to like a whole bunch of charges coming in and out, but they don't, okay? That only happens after, you know, 10 minutes, right? Then you see a jump. And now you can very nicely measure the phase slip in between those two different trajectories, and you see that it's 2 pi over 3. Okay? And then you can do this again. You can keep incrementing it, and then boom, another phase slip a few minutes later. And so a few minutes at a time, you can get, you know, one charge to jump into your interferometer, into your interferometer, and so on. And each time it's basically 2 pi over 3. Okay? Okay, so you can sort of try to accumulate these statistics, and you can see that it you know, spreads around 2 pi over 3. Sorry, this blue really didn't render on this projector. And you can make these kind of triple helix patterns from, you know, n, n plus 1, n plus 2 uh, quasi-particles, and then n plus 3, n plus 4, n plus 5, and so on and so forth. Um, now, uh, once you're sweeping, you know, one parameter, you can even say, why don't I just not sweep any parameters at all? right, and just see what happens as a function of time. So I think the next talk from Chen Hao is about dynamics. This is also about dynamics, but it's like millihertz dynamics or microhertz dynamics of these single quasi-particles. So here what we do is basically pump probe, okay? We pump it by just changing the magnetic field and then we stop. And then we just wait and we see what happens. And so this is as a function of time and all we're doing is again just ramping back and forth the breathing of the interferometer area and you can see that there's a few jumps that happen over the course of half an hour, okay? And you can quantify the size of these jumps. There's actually kind of a neat thing that I'm not going to get into is that you can actually identify because of a sort of a fingerprint of this interference pattern whether you actually return to the same state or you've gone to a new state. And actually you can see that you return to the same state and that that involves sometimes jumping two enions out at the same time or at least faster than we can see in the measurement. And there's other data that we don't understand very well where it seems like you can arrange it so that two enions, ju enions jump out in pairs. There's actually a pretty big literature on this type of pairing, which we're not sure maybe this is, this is connected to. But you can basically watch, again, over half an hour, you know, a few enions dribble in to the interferometer uh, and just catch them, you know, one at a time. Okay, so I, how much time do I have left? Do I have five minutes left? Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to just sort of blitz through uh, something totally different. So, um, so, okay, so that's sort of where we're at with 
conventional fractional quantum Hall phases. Um, there's, of course, you know, a lot of interest now in fractional turn insulators, right? In particular, you know, zero magnetic field fractional turn insulators. So why? You know, okay, one answer is, I think, encapsulated by a lot of discussion today. You know, you'd like to connect them to some Hamiltonian. You'd like to understand how microscopically they come out of, you know, a model, right? And that's a great thing for KITP, right? But for an experimentalist, I want to ask, like, maybe a little bit sharper question, like, what's this going to do for me now, right? And there's sort of two things that I think are pretty obvious uh, potential benefits. One is that you'd like to get bigger gaps in the fractional quantum hall, right? Fractional quantum hall, the gaps go like E squared over LB. And in these fractional turn insulators at zero field, they're in principle go like E squared over lambda, the lattice constant. And shrinking LB beyond a certain point is just incredibly expensive, right? And shrinking the lattice is, you know, about, doesn't cost you anything more than it did to make a bigger lattice, right? So, so that's great. You'd like to make that, you'd like, you know, it'd be nice if you could get gaps that are big, right? And then another is that the zero field nature means they're compatible with superconductors. That just becomes easy, right? Now, there's a sort of fancy reason, which is, okay, now you can make fractional turn insulators or, or integer turn insulators, make defect states at boundaries with superconductors. That's great. Definitely is gonna be interesting. Obviously, we know this state, this type of system superconducts, this type of system also probably superconducts. It's all, everything superconducts, so it's all gonna superconduct, and you can do that type of thing. Um, but there's a more prosaic reason, which is that uh, actually superconductors are great experimental tools. There are great sensors that you can make out of them, and so you can sort of combine those, uh, you know, pretty pretty straightforwardly in a way that you can't in you know high field churn insulators or high field fractional quantum Hall phases. It just doesn't work. Right? So that's what I'll show you. So so the experiment I'll show you uh, uses a nano squid on tip. This is a technique you know developed at Weizmann, um, but we've built up in my lab over the now the last you know 10 years or so. Actually, recently we've made some breakthroughs in sensitivity, so we now can make squids that have deeply sub nanotesla per root hertz sensitivity. So I'm going to show you imaging with a few hundred picotesla per root hertz uh, squid that's about 150 nanometers in size. And we're just going to go and park it over a twisted molly telluride uh, device or two or three, courtesy of Jachi and, and friends at UW. Um, and we're going to do the following. We're going to measure the local fringe magnetic field as a function of the applied gate voltages. Now, one of the nice things about doing magnetic imaging is that the graphite gates and the Bohr nitride dielectric just don't screen any of the magnetic fields. They have very you know, minimal effects on the permeability. So, um, so you can just see the magnetic fields coming from the, uh, the, the 2D layer inside as a function of the density and displacement field tuned phase diagram. Okay, so this is what a local image looks like of just the DC magnetic field. And you'll recognize it. Uh, it looks the same shape as what you saw in Jachi's talk earlier. It's just exactly where you see RMCD. Right, but this is, measure, this is measuring the fringe magnetic field in sort of a 200 nanometer area. And, uh, and this is what data looks like uh, if you just sit at a certain spot. In blue, you see the DC magnetic field, okay? And in orange, you see the modulated magnetic field that you get if you modulate the charge carrier density. So you can think about this as roughly analogous to derivative of magnetization as with respect to uh, density, okay? And the thing that I want you to notice is first there's a big jump here, right, with a peak. That's where magnetization onsets. That's just now you now have a valley polarized ferromagnet. And then you have a deep dip right at nu equals minus one. You have another dip at two thirds, another dip at three fifths, another dip at four sevenths, and if you're generous, another dip at five ninths. And then you have a dip when magnetization goes away. Okay? So this just looks like each of these dips basically corresponds to what you'd expect if you have a churn insulator that has a negative churn number, then dmd mu is going to be negative, and, uh, and basically the area under this dip is sort of related to the energy gap, okay, if it were magnetization. As a matter of fact, this is actually just the magnetic field measured, so you have to turn that into magnetization if you want to understand uh, quantitatively what's going on, okay? But there's some qualitative things we can say. Actually, just again, this is sort of a note for the experts working on this particular material, but there's been some debate about what's the nature of the phase transition at nu equals minus one, right? Is it churn insulator? Is there some gapless state? Or is there some topologically trivial insulator that's still valley polarized and so on? We can say pretty unambiguously, it's a first order transition. You go from a C equals minus one churn insulator to a valley unpolarized state, and there's just not multiple states. And it's pretty clear why this has been confusing. It's because there's lots of disorder in the system, which I'll show you in a minute, right? So it's pretty easy if you're averaging any more than a couple hundred nanometers to just see 
you know, differences in where this transition occurs. But you can see there's an extremely sharp change in the magnetization. It happens right at nu equals minus one. And, at, and the, the gap, which is this faint blue feature, just persists right up to the edge of that transition, okay? Interestingly, right, the transition is very clearly first order right at nu equals minus one, but becomes much broader uh, when you dope the system away from nu equals minus one. So in the metallic phases, it's a lot broader. Whether it's still first order or not at lower temperatures, these, temp these measurements are all at one and a half Kelvin, I don't know. I suspect it's still first order, but it's much less strongly first order uh, in, at metallic filling factors than it is at, at the uh, gapped filling, uh, commensurate filling factors. Okay, we can also be quantitative, right? So we can actually, you know, convert our local imaging data into magnetization, and we can look at the change in magnetization, and that change in magnetization is just directly related to the thermodynamic gap, okay? And what we find is that the thermodynamic gap at uh, two-thirds is seven milli electron volts. That's almost exactly the same as the gap for like a 14 Tesla, very clean uh, monolayer graphene system, right? And the gap at nu equals minus one is 14 MeV. There's actually, it's not entirely clear that this is uh, consistent with transport data uh, at this point, and that may just have to do with uh, locality or, you know, or disorder, not clear. So anyway, the last thing I'll say, maybe one minute, perfect, is, um, is that, you know, the big challenge, you know, these measurements also reveal really the big challenge in the system from the point of view of if you want to push it to do interferometry or try to do, you know, commensurability oscillations or any of the things we talked about before. Because almost all of those things require having basically the same filling factor in a pretty large area. And that's just not the case here. So what's plotted here are just cuts as a function of the, essentially the density, so the sum of the top and bottom gate voltages, and position. And this is the nu equals one gap in dark blue, and this is the nu equals two thirds gap in, dark, in, in lighter blue here. And you can just see that basically the distance between them as well as their positions is just varying a great deal. So you can convert this into, say, an effective twist angle, and you can see that the effective twist angle or the effective more unit cell area varies by about 10%, you know, per micron or something like that. And there's pretty much submicron correlated, you know, twist angle domains. And you can actually map that out. So this is a map of the effective twist angle in this device, and you can see that sort of you have half, half micron patches that are reasonably uniform. And I think that makes sense. Most of the transport data that has worked in the system has, has worked by virtue of making the device about a half a micron, so you can sort of, and then getting lucky that you got one of these domains that's pretty uniform. That's how that, that's how that came about. I think this also obviously very naturally explains why, you know, RXX doesn't always show the same thing that RXY does. It's not surprising, right? And this is a very much characteristic of especially homo bilayer moiré systems. It's just very hard to stabilize, you know, the exact same structure everywhere. Every little strain you put in gets trapped, and, uh, and that's just how it is. It's kind of cool that despite this pretty big structural disorder, actually the turn insulator and fractional turn insulator devices, they, they states they exist over a large area, uh, a large range of parameters. You, they just won't be there at, under the same conditions everywhere in the device at the same time. You have to tune, as you tune your gate voltage, different parts of the device go through, you know, this state at a different density or different displacement field. Last note is actually there's more sources of disorder that we don't totally understand. So one is that actually there seems to be a built-in dipole electric field, so that the displacement field that corresponds to zero displacement field is different than zero, and it's different in different parts of the sample. So it's as if there's just a built-in dipole. There's also sort of a built-in monopole. If you want to think about like where the, you know, where the band edge is, you can extrapolate where that is, and that also varies a lot as a function of position. And presumably this just comes from you know, heterostrain and other microscopic disorder. I'm not sure what the microscopic origin of this, but it's not terribly surprising. But these are actually not such small effects. So, um, so anyway, so that's sort of what we've learned uh, about this system so far. So uh, let me finish, right, and just say, you know, I've shown you some experiments in graphene. It's now a pretty clean system for doing fractional quantum Hall experiments. I would say so far we've been pretty happy with the fact that, you know, the physics of abelian enions is sort of working as predicted. Obviously, the $64,000 question is, you know, what's new, right? Like, what can we do with non-abelian states? We have a pretty robust, you know, presumed Fafian in Bernal bilayer graphene. That's what we're working on now to see if we can get interferometry to work, and there's progress, but nothing to report yet. Um, I think on the twisted Molly telluride, it's kind of amazing that you get comparable gaps to these really well-refined fractional quantum Hall systems, even though clearly the system is very disordered both microscopically and not. So I think there's a lot of promise there for just some numbers getting bigger, which would be 
which would be great, um, but there's a lot of sort of material science work that has to happen, I think, before we can actually do mesoscopics at the same level as fractional quantum Hall phases. But, you know, six months from now, it could all be different. So. All right, thank you. So given this is inhomogeneous, do you see edge states in uh, this twisted MOT2, the edge states of the... I mean, my MOT2. understanding of what we're actually looking at is we're just seeing the equilibrium current of the edge states throughout the middle of the device all the time. You know, the, there's edge states everywhere. Uh, not just, usually on the edge, right? <laughs> like, uh -huh. So yeah. you don't have the, uh, like with your compressibility measurement, you can't resolve... A feature yeah, I, like you, you have. So this. you mean like an actual current in an edge state? Well, even just the compressibility changing as you. So we're measuring push. magnetization, right, okay. and not compressibility. Uh -huh. And the way I think about that is that if you have a small patch that's in the gap, and then outside it's not in the gap, there is an edge state there, which is the chiral edge state, and there has an equilibrium current. That's just equivalent to saying mm -hmm. there's a magnetization change across a turn insulator gap. That's just the equilibrium current. And of you're the edge picking state. that up everywhere as you go through. It's this. a network and it moves around and the patch that is incompressible, you know, it'd be cool to sort of correlate this with compressibility. It's hard to do that with a dual gated device. But, um, you know, where it's incompressible, that's where it lights up blue because there's a current that's going around it. That's, we see the current, mm -hmm. actually, the equilibrium current of the edge state. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so for the quantum point contact, I was wondering if you have tried doing like a nu equals one half and nu equals one instead of nu equals one third. Yeah, it, you know, each each fraction is its own experiment <laughs> for various right, reasons, right, right. right? So, yeah. you know, the, the big problem with all of these types of systems, as everybody knows, edge reconstruction, okay? We're very lucky that for the particular edge electrostatics that we can realize, it seems like the dominant edge reconstruction that you get is a one-third. So then it was easy to do one-third, but actually it's almost too universal. Like if you keep looking, you see this one-third edge actually for a very broad range of filling factors. So it's not like we're working with perfectly sharp edges. We're working with edges that luckily, smartly, whatever it is, reconstruct a one-third. For one-half, you have to do this in bilayer graphene, and actually that turns out to be complicated for other reasons that we're working through. So I think it'll work eventually, but we haven't done it. Is it possible to do noise yeah. measurements on the same kind of devices? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible and interesting. Not probably possible in my lab, given. Yeah, we've we've done, we've sent some devices for collaboration, and uh -huh. there's data which I don't know that I understand enough to say anything okay. about. But it's it's totally possible. I think it's yeah. just a matter of doing it. So they all correspond to fractional quantum hostility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing that makes us think this is a Fafian yeah. is that these kinks are the right daughter states for the Fafian and not for, like, the 331 or the anti-Fafian. Okay, well, uh, the half state has, like, almost as big a gap as their one-third and two-third, right? So indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The biggest gap we've gotten for that, not this data set, but then it was about one millivolt, which is, uh -huh. you know, and, and a five Kelvin activation gap. That's, like, five or ten times yeah. bigger than in gallium arsenide, so yeah. that's good, yeah. So for you, interferometer, is, is the process of the quasi-particle jumping in and out symmetric, and you see both? You see both. It's a little bit hard to tell, because we just measure the phase. And so there's a little, you know, you have, there's a little bit of a model that you have to have there for, you know, what does a phase jump, does a phase jump correspond to one quasi-particle jumping in or two jumping out? Oh, I see. Um, okay. And, you know, bulk edge coupling actually I think helps us resolve that a little bit because that tends to lower the size of the phase jump. So we can sort of distinguish, but I wouldn't say we know this for sure. Actually, experiment I'm very excited about is just to image this nanosquid. In principle, you can image at least integer quantum hall. Mm -hmm. You could just look at where the quasi particles are and see whether they're jumping in or out while you do this experiment. I think an imaging experiment would be the really satisfying way to do this. I think. One quarter is there. Yeah, those are like four flux states, yeah. yeah. 
So, so you see this uh, jumps when an electron enters the interferometer, uh, and you see them occurring as, as a function of time. I wonder if there is, if it would, can be potentially possible to cause this on demand, like by, by tuning some, some gate voltage or something. Yeah, you, I mean, it's like ordering uh, pizza, right? You can, it's, you, did you demand it? Yes. Does it come instantly? No, but it'll come later, right? So you change the gates and then you have to wait. And then it will come, right? Uh, but it just takes a while, right? Okay, so uh, there's no, no no way like to have a quantum dot nearby to maybe. No, I think I think that that's the interesting thing to that's the interesting thing to do is to try to like figure out how to have a few of these. Like what this experiment tells us, is you can really isolate a few of them from everything else. Then, if you have some local control, you should be able to move them around. You know where you, where the barriers are small where you can actually control the barriers. Here we're sort of relying on some natural barriers. You want the natural barriers to be really big because those are the ones you can't get rid of. Then you can always make a barrier smaller between two controlled sites, for example. Thank you. Do you see till fifth? Uh, yes. Uh, it's that guy. Uh, so the, so it's not great. <laughs> Is better than gallium arsenide. <laughs> yeah, it's it's there's this there's a tricky detail of Bernal bilayer graphene, which is that it looks the most like the n equals one Landau level at low fields, and then as you go to higher fields, it looks more and more like the n like a mixture of n equals zero and n equals one. That turns out to be okay for the Fafian. The Fafian survives, but the three fifths like becomes a Jane state, you know, somewhere along the line. So probably at low fields, you really clearly see three fifths and not two fifths. And you say, okay, that's good. That's probably our that's probably our our, our candidate, right? But um, but then if you go to higher fields, you see one half, and then Jane sequence on both sides, and that's probably where the pseudo potentials have just become favorable for Jane sequence. And so it's an interesting thing, but it makes working with this sort of three fifths in the regime of interest pretty painful. You know, you have to work at low fields, and then the gaps are just small because e squared over LB is small. Which, this data, this was a dill fridge, the temperature dependence is, helium-3 is, is, wouldn't look that different, actually. Yeah, a few hundred millikelvins is fine. Uh, for the thermodynamic stuff, it's not that important, I would say, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a complicated measurement, like with a sensor layer and so on, so it's hard to translate exactly to transport measurements, but, yeah. But temperature itself is not a huge issue. <laughs> Maybe I have a quick question. So, um, can you explain a little bit uh, uh, again about the bulk edge coupling that you were mentioning? Right. So, so the big problem in historically in these interferometry experiments is that if a charge moves into the interferometer, you know, it's a droplet of charge, and that charge repels the rest of it. So, it can lead to a phase slip that just comes from the fact that the droplet expanded. Right? And, um, and so first you have the, you know, it turns out that when that bulk edge coupling is strong enough, actually it can completely obscure this anion phase anyway. And even when it's not that strong, it can give you some quantitative correction, which in general will decrease the size of this phase slip. So you have to be quite careful to kind of characterize that bulk edge coupling, which I think Mike Manfra like did sort of for the first time really carefully in terms of really measuring it and measuring it at different states and so on. Our control experiment, which I didn't show, is just to look at the same type of sudden phase slips in an integer quantum hall state in the same type of device. And there you see that, in fact, when a charge enters, you also see the same sort of slow dynamics, but when a charge enters, you see something that's consistent with a bulk edge coupling that's basically consistent with the electrostatics. You'll get a phase slip for that whole electron of 0.05, maybe up to 0.1, instead of 2 pi over 3, okay? And so then, you know, Okay, then you have to believe, and you see them also somewhat randomly distributed around zero, right? Um, so then, you know, here you have to believe that the, the charges are E over three. They're smaller, so they should have smaller bulk edge coupling because the charge is smaller. And, you know, the corrections that we see are, again, roughly consistent with the size of bulk edge coupling you'd, you'd expect for electrostatics. It's interesting, some of the phase slips, bulk edge coupling, it's a property of where the anion goes. If it goes near the edge, it's not screened by the gate, and there's big bulk edge coupling. And we totally see some events 
that seem to go near the edge, and then they have a weird unquantized value of the phase slip, but most of them seem to go into the bulk, and especially the ones that are really slow and irreversible, go deep into the bulk and have very little bulk edge coupling. Any other questions? Just a quick follow-up on that. I thought the challenge was to get a device in, in Monfra's uh, experiments to would have a high capacity, so then this coupling is very weak. So is right. it easier in your system to overcome that? Yes, or? yes, because uh, I think the historic challenge in gallium arsenide was that if you put metal gates on top, for the same reason we don't like to use metal gates, you make it dirty and it doesn't work and you know, various other problems happen. The way Manfra solved this was to have a two deg and then two more two degs, one on each side, about 30 or 40 nanometers away. The way we solve it is that those are our gates. Those are the graphite gates. So those are, again, exactly the same distance away. And so that capacitance of bulk to gates is the same. It's the same statement as saying that an anion or a charge in the bulk, its electric field will not be seen by the edge because it's screened by a nearby metal. Mm -hmm. It's the same statement, right? And, uh, and the electrostatic geometry is very nearly the same. Thank you. So it's very similar bulk capacitance, very similar dimensions. I mean, we, we took a lot from that experiment.